Hi, it's Mickey Dolenz here. You're listening to Inspirado Projecto. Ladies and gentlemen, aliens and creatures, amphibians and air molecules, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. We are going to give your ears a treat. This go this this conversation goes down uh, many various rabbit holes, all of which are highly vibrational. It'll get your mind thinking, clinking, clanking, sklinkity sklanking. Perhaps do doing some research. In, uh, in ye old Google machine. Mechanics, machinations. Speaking of machinations uh, and imaginations. Machinations and imaginations. Imaginations. The Imagination Machination. Ooh, that's good. I got to remember that title. The Imagination Machination. That's good. Uh, we're going to have... After this extraordinary interview with DJ Scaramanga Silk, one of the forefathers of Christor Inc., you've been hearing me talk about <coughs> Christor Inc. over the past, uh, you know, several episodes. First hearing about it from Spencer McCall, uh, then, then of course, you hearing my stories of going down the rabbit hole on there, and then, of course, then interview with Wiley Henderson introduced to me by DJ Scarmanga Silk I uh, mistakenly thought ah no I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to that's classified so here we are Scarmanga Silk if you go to chrisstoreinc.com I can guarantee you that you will see what DJ Scarmanga Silk looks like phenomenal phenomenal video up there some great great stuff so uh without further ado and definitely without a, a further ado don't we're gonna we're gonna jump into this interview this is the first part of an interview with dj scarmanga silk uh by the way go to soundcloud.com slash well look up scaramanga silk and designer scribble and SoundCloud. Put those things in the search engines. And you'll find an extraordinary piece of uh, sound art here. I'm looking at right now a drawing of uh, a neon character as his profile photo. That's, that's, that's the vibe you're going to get in this conversation you're about to hear. All right, enough of my talking. think when I say the words information superhighway remember when Al Gore invented the internet and they talked about this you know you're going to be able to go off on an off ramp on the information superhighway get your information all your movies and your internet and all your photos and your music and chats I mean we had America Online remember you've got mail Fantastic. Do we have DJ Scaramanga Silk on the line? Hey, Kurt. Good morning. How are you? Thank you for having me, sir. Good. Good. I'm doing great. And thank you for being on. Um, <clears throat> deciding to be on the on the podcast. This is very exciting. I first came across you on uh, in your. Um, <laughs> it looks like a great, like a uh, sparkly silver uh, morph suit on the um, Christor page, and uh, give yes. a testimonial about yep. their uh, about their fine products. Yes, um, yeah. I mean that uh, whole project and world, as you're aware, is um, quite a fantastic uh, universe that they've built, and um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun to uh, be a small part of uh, that journey 
with how, the did, team. how did you end up getting to be a part of it? So it was several years ago. I was literally on one of those evenings just trying to find something to watch and I stumbled purely by accident on the Institute. So it's quite interesting. Over here in the UK, so I'm, I'm based in, in London, and no one in my sort of circle had mentioned that documentary to me. I hadn't read about it anywhere. So I literally was just like, sometimes I just like to go into something blind. So don't watch the trailer. Don't try and read too much. Just look at a little title. Have a look at the artwork. Maybe read a very first line of a synopsis and just just give something a go. So ended up watching the documentary and I was absolutely blown away by it. The, the level of creativity, uh, the level of risk, the, the level of invention, the humour, just everything about it that Jeff and um, his team and obviously Spencer who captured all of that footage uh, was fantastic. So naturally it's a being a universe that it is there's a lot of rabbit holes that can go down there's a lot of stuff out there that you can dig into and i'm the kind of person who likes to delve deeper into those sorts of projects i love to find out as much as possible and as i was doing that i later realized that there was a another project um from spencer called the esquire so i saw that uh, spencer was working on that so i managed to track him down um, and he was uh, very graceful. We had a really good conversation, and I basically just uh, expressed that I'd really like to get involved in some capacity and, and help out. And that is my entry into that world. So I actually didn't come into Crystal originally, I came into the Esquire. And as you're aware, the Esquire turned into Grandview Boulevard, and from that came Crystal incredible man that institute documentary i was just equally blown away by that i mean i love the you you couldn't tell who it, it was so, what was cool to me was like i i kept going back and forth in my brain going okay uh, is this is this person an improv actor who's pretending that they had gone through this thing or is this an actual person who went through this thing and and i loved how they played with our brains like that and then i loved the fact that there was an actual i i actually t i talked to someone it was funny because i had seen that uh, documentary and then it was a couple of months later I happened to be at a party and some guy there said oh that's like the Jejun Institute I said okay hold on a second what do you know about the Jejun Institute because I, I didn't hear anybody like even talking about it uh, or even about that movie and this guy told me he was out there in San Francisco and he was visiting a friend and a friend of his said oh yeah if you want something to do I'm going to be at work today but if you want go check out this this place and ask him about the Jejun Institute and, and see how that works out for you and from that moment forward he went on this big journey of like what the heck did I get myself into so it was really cool to meet someone in person who actually went through that and to verify that the stuff in the movie was actually that stuff was actually real and actually a part of um you know a part of reality and uh, I just love the idea that somehow they're able to get all these people together to uh, to kind of make San Francisco kind of like a play set. They, they kind of turned it into their own. Um, yeah, like their own play set. Like, OK, you know, over here, we're going to hide a clue and over there, we're going to hide a clue. And there's this thing to check out. And... Um, yeah, I mean, totally. Kurt. I mean, you're so lucky over there in the States to have these kind of things on this scale um as far as i'm aware here in the uk we don't really have anything uh, like that in terms of the whole arg world um and like yourself one of the things that really captured my imagination and appeals to me in terms of creativity and well it's, it's, it's crossed over into the real world now but especially at that time is the blurring of lines between fact and fiction and the real world and what just trying to figure out you know what what really is here, the the happening here what where's the line um and those guys just done it with so much flair and so much fun and like you're saying the the fact that it was uh in, in a physical world and that you could go to all of these places and interact and there are all these different narratives 
uh, yeah, even now, talking about all these years later, it still massively inspires me. It is, and that's what was so cool when they finally came up about, about making dispatches from elsewhere. Where you know, I'm sure there are a lot, a lot more new fans now that are coming across the institute thanks to dispatches from elsewhere and opening up their brains and people looking at this going, "What the heck? This is sort of this is based on a true story. <laughs> you know, this is amazing." And um, it's just so cool that there's a project that turns the everyday sort of mundaneity uh, of life into an actual, it kind of turns, they're turning your life into an actual theme park where everywhere you're going, you're kind of looking at it through a new lens. And it's it's really cool because it, it definitely puts you in the driver's seat of freedom of choice. Are you going to choose to, to give in to the fun and the excitement and the playfulness of this particular um, story that they're unfolding for you? Or are you going to sit on the sidelines and, and go, oh, well, that's fake or that's fake or, oh, yeah, they, they're trying to pull another one over on me. Because um, that's definitely not going, you know, bring about any great uh, feats of, of wonderment or curiosity. I think the fact that they created something like that, it really it's a great beacon to those of us who love to find the Easter eggs and also love to hide the Easter eggs as well. Yes. Um, I mean, the fact that dispatches from elsewhere came into existence on the network of AMC is a fantastic tribute to, to the legacy of that work. And I thought it was fantastic and you know, really beautiful how part of the essence of what they captured was the whole aspect of, that bit of bravery, stepping out of your comfort zone, going on an adventure, not really, you know, and having faith in terms of, you know, you're going to go on an adventure. You don't necessarily fully know <laughs> what you're getting involved in, but yeah. there's something about it where you're giving them your trust. And then over time, it's, it's repaid back to you. And you actually learn not just about yourself, but about all sorts of, sort of aspects of the world around you. You start seeing, you know, all of those familiar locations in San Francisco where all those guys from the original institute would have been going down those streets every day, suddenly see a little poster with something a little bit different and it turns into something joyous, which is, uh, yeah, very, very inspiring. It's so fun how they're putting you, they put you into a choose your own adventure. They're putting you into like an actual, <laughs> like I used to play Dungeons and Dragons growing up and this kind of reminds me of like a real life yes. role playing game, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so cool because it teaches you about cooperation. It teaches you about collaboration. It teaches you about yes and. It's teaching you about, okay, this person's idea um, is is so way out there, it just might work. You know, I've seen so much strange stuff already with the, with the Jejun Institute antics. Okay, that person's idea and theory, it just might work. Who knows, you know? And then people try stuff and they test things out. And, um, it, and then it's because of their curiosity. It's because they dare to look beyond what's right there in front of them. It's because they, they look for it, then they find it. It's cool. It's like, oh, as, as a result of you uh, stepping out of your comfort zone and checking this thing out, as a result of that, here's this hidden little this hidden little gift, all because you did that. And <laughs> you never would have found it if you didn't test it out. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think we were briefly talking the other day and I mentioned to you that back in 2018, um, over here in the UK, it wasn't an ARG, but a similar kind of uh, concept was run by the KLF. Uh, so for those that don't know, that's a massive sort of pop pop dance band from the early 90s who had some huge hits with t tracks like Free Am Eternal, What Time Is Love, um, and various other tracks that anyone from that era would know. They uh, did a bit of a comeback in Liverpool. It was a three-day event. Um, it wasn't billed as a festival, and it was literally only open to 400 people to participate. So I was very fortunate to be uh able to get a ticket and to attend that event so it was tied in over three days with a book that they'd published under one of her other names which was the justified ancients of moo moo but the whole thing was really about audience participation and the audience actually driving the narrative of of those days and and as those guys as, as you, i know you're aware of their work they're not particularly known well i say they're not known for it's not the focus of their work but they're actually great storytellers and also very, very comedic. I think I think it goes a little bit miss just quite how witty these guys are with their work. But um, one of the standout um, moments, which I think if you'd have been able to attend, Kurt, you would have absolutely loved this, was on the second day, 
Um, what they did was we were gathered in a what's called the bombed out church, which is in the in the set in the centre of uh, Liverpool City. And when we entered into the church, it's like open top. Um, we were divided into two groups, and we had to stand in the middle of a church along two aisles. And Jimmy Courty and Bill Drummond, who who are the KLF, walked down those aisles, and everyone on one side of the aisle was given a page from the book so they're given an even page and everyone on the other side was given an odd page and from that we were then organized into chapters uh, according to the book and leading on from that we were then all given a task that something from that particular page of the book we would then have to go away and in the next few hours create a piece of art no matter Whoa. what it could be and then come back and then present Whoa. that piece of art back to the team then also on top of that as a chapter we would then have to come back and then do a small performance at the end of the day incredible so yeah so and you've got to remember at this time so the book had literally only just been published uh the, on the day before so no one none of us had read the book none of, no one had would have had time so we didn't know the full narrative so we were all given a, a tiny chunk of this it was about well obviously about a 400 page book and we don't obviously no one knows the full context so you're literally just taking these few paragraphs of text having to interpret in your own way and then basically we retold the story back to so we presented it back to the just violation movie the klf through our own performances at the end of the day and it was incredible we had people reciting poetry we had people doing street art we had people writing songs. We had some people even built websites in that oh time. God. We had people doing performance art in in improvised parts of the city. People just doing uh, video things. It was it was incredible. It was so imad- incredibly creative. Um, and yeah, that sort of participatory art, which I know has been growing a lot in in the last few years, but to walk into that in in, in that time and for those guys to put something like that on, it was incredibly memorable. Oh my gosh. Wow, man. Wow, man. You know, and when you see stuff like that, and the, when you see stuff like that, and you see stuff like with the Jejun Institute, those those yeah. things are like microcosms of what is totally possible all over the world. That idea of, hey, let's have fun together. Here's a strange novel concept. Let's create something, you know, uh, um, together where we're not having to find ways of, of argue with each other. Let's let's find a, a safe zone where we can find agreements and find ways of creating a reality together and exploring imaginations together and um and just go and just go with it and see what happens and it's amazing when you have stuff like that that shows you what is capable what what you're truly capable of and what's possible when given a very short time limit it really it 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 shows us that you know we really don't need to spend as much time as we do procrastinating um it's just it reminds me of like that kind of like uh uh, I'm sure this this might have happened to you, like in high school or whatever. They give you like a a, a, a science project and you got to get it done in three weeks. And then the night before, you're like, you know, you're putting it off, putting it off. And the night before, you're like, oh god, I I got it, I got to do this thing because otherwise, I'm just it's tomorrow, you know. So then you, you know me too well, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> and then you whip it up and you're like, what the heck? How was that possible? How did I do that in in, in three hours? <laughs> like it only took three hours. Why didn't I just do that? right in the beginning and I could have taken it easy this whole time you know and it's like it's so funny I think it's so necessary that we have aspects like that that we have those opportunities to go okay all right we're pressing the start button right now and it's up to you to just create it (laughs) okay go yeah yeah so I mean procrastination in terms of creativity is a, it's a fascinating one it's funny actually I was, I've been I read all sorts of stuff and I, I know you're a big reader as well and it turns out that that behavior that you just described in terms of people who leave it to the last minute even though it's highly pressured and you always feel you haven't really done just it turns out that those people in the long run because they can work under that level of pressure actually end up having pretty good careers <laughs> oh my god I know oh I know it's a, it's a real surprise but and also time you know time pressure like, as you talk about I think is a fascinating area for creativity because um it's, it's you know in some ways it's so important to impose a deadline right and like one project um that I think's 
quite interesting. I sort of got involved in a little while, but there's a guy, uh, there's a music producer over here in the UK called Mike Monday. And a while back, I think he was one of the first people to start one of these. I mean, they're, they're, well, I'd say they're, they're quite evident, but his, his angle's quite unique in terms of these sort of self-help courses for music producers. But he wasn't doing your usual YouTube, how to, you know, compress a drum beat and all of that kind of stuff. He was much more focused on the psychological barriers um, that music producers come up against. So, you know, and really helping people to finish projects. And one of the things, one of the exercises that he came up with, which was really fascinating to me, was he was like, for 10 days in a row, write a different track every day, but don't spend more than one hour on it. And if it's not finished at the end of the hour, it doesn't matter. Just get out a fresh idea every day for 10 days. And then come back to those ideas at the end of that. And what you will see is you will see where you're at in terms of all of your influences and where you're sort of going in terms of styles, creation and your ideas. So a lot of times I wouldn't follow these sort of things, but I was actually given a project where a friend of mine was creating an, like an online game. And I know you're a, a big gamer as well. So he was creating like a little sci-fi space physics game. Um, so he needed some sound for it. But because, especially at the time we were doing it, the actual bandwidth for this kind of stuff, the actual music files had to be really short. So I had to create some really, really tight loops. So he needed a load of like 30 second loops to sort of uh, backtrack or soundtrack his music. So I literally used that exercise of my oh, days where I... Wow. And I, I, I created 10 tracks, um, really saw where I was, gave him those. He used a handful of them. And for me, it was a fantastic exercise outside of being able to supply someone uh, with material for his uh, online game. I was then able to see where I was at, sort of see the sort of styles certain strengths certain things that i could progress and then from there i went on to develop two of those tracks which then went on to featuring my debut album designer scribble so i felt as a particular exercise it was great you know that that's that time pressure and that also no need to you know finish something just go here's an hour every day 10 days see where you're at and i'd recommend any music producer to do it at some point in their career because you, you, you learn a lot very quickly. And it's, it's really, and also it's a great way of unblocking yourself if you're ever coming up against any blocks. Wow. You know, it's so interesting. Two things about that. One thing is <clears throat> that um, ha- working in that fashion, it, it, it cuts away the fat. And by the fat, I'm talking about yeah. over analysis and over critiquing. <laughs> it just cuts it right out of the equation. And it goes, you're going yeah. straight on inspiration, buddy. Okay, here you go. You're going high octane, pure inspiration. You're not. You're not allowed to get in the way of yourself. Sorry. Okay, and go. And then now you gotta just. You gotta just go with the inspiration, and it's it's crazy and it's beautiful. Um, because you know it's it's such a crazy conundrum because, um, people that I've talked to, it it it's like, for some reason, there's this idea that art cannot be art or or even uh, what's the word um respected as art unless you toil through it unless you go through the blood sweat and tears and so torture, true you yeah. know and then it's almost like what what's worth more the the, the what, what's what's more valuable the story of how much you toiled to make this thing or the story of the fact that you made the, or the fact that here it is and you made this thing, you know? And I think sometimes pe- artists fall in love with the that romantic idea of, oh, it took me 15 years to make this thing. And, oh, it better make a big splash. Otherwise, I'm going to, you know, kill myself if no one loves it. Well, man, that's, that's unfortunate to put that kind of pressure on your shoulders. And then on top of that, it's also unfair to discount the exact kind of art that you're talking about, which is that, that, you know, striking right when the inspiration is there and, um, uh, and, and moving along with it. And for some reason, I, I don't know why this is, but that kind of thing it does not seem to be as encouraged as much. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, wh- why do you, su- why do you suppose people don't encourage each other to just doodle more often or to uh, do projects like you're, you're just, you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I've I've been listening a lot to your podcast, Kurt. So I, I should have said earlier, I, you know, I've become a, a big fan wow, in, since discovering what you're doing. Um, I think it's really great that there's someone like yourself out there who celebrates and explores creativity the way that you do. 
and also all the other stuff that you know you've got super positive and the amount of projects that you're involved in uh, I find that fascinating you know you're a musician you run a film festival I know you've done improv in the past you're an actor I mean that's intimidating for me to talk to someone who's doing that much <laughs> yeah. stuff I, you know I find it quite humble but um yeah and so you know over here and I assume it's in the states I think this is something you might have touched upon in other other podcasts that you've had with other guests but oh, there's something about the system I don't necessarily if it's educational or societal expectations that unfortunately as you grow older that urge to be creative is is sort of taken out of you you know I still think unfortunately we're still in a society where and it's understandable you know if, if we go into the psychology of like sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs you know we've basically got to get out there and, and survive right so you know you go through your education process and then you're like right I've got to, I've got to earn money I've got to get a roof over my head and you know family oh, yeah. etc all those sorts of pressures and you know everyone's in that boat but because that's there and then you know things are tough out there especially in the current world and if we're in many many ways so because of that it's hard to for a lot of people to then go back to that playful creative version that they would have had as as kids which i think it's a real shame because you know even if you're not necessarily of that ilk as you get older i think it can actually work for you in any context no matter what job you're doing on a day-to-day if you've got that attitude and you can sit and look at a problem no matter what you're doing if you're a banker or a computer developer or anything you know that sort of creative mode can re um, you know re- bring massive rewards so unfortunately I've, yeah i think it's managed out of people and yeah you know, i'm you know a bit like yourself i try to urge that creative spark because i don't know if you find this i i'm i don't know where it came from i i, I think i got more creative as i got older i think uh, I started, started to discover certain passions, especially around music, sort of into my late teens, and that just developed more and more and more. And I started working in record shops, etc. And from that, um, you know, I, I'm really keen to sort of see people develop and you know keep being creative because I think it's, it's just really great for your mind, it's great for your self esteem, it's great for your mood, it's great for people around you. Um, but for me, I've, I've found that if I'm not creating or working on some sort of, I just have a niggling sort of mm-hmm. angst that I'm not doing what I'm meant to be doing. And I, um, it's a bit of a curse in yes. some ways, because <laughs> in some ways you just want to step away from it. And so, yeah, you've been there, right? You know what I'm talking about. So I think creative people just don't know where it comes from. That They just have that niggling urge where they have to do it, which I think is a, a beautiful thing. And that's why some people, when they've got, they they do it for their entire life, which I think is a, a really, really beautiful thing. It is, you know, it is. It's like, it, 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 you know, I frequently say that I'm addicted to ideas. I'm I'm addicted to ideas. Love that. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like there are so many juicy ones, and I, you know, and I try to. I, I think that's why. That's. I mean, I write a lot of stuff down. So in a sense, that's kind of like my dream catcher. You know, all the ideas. I write them all down, and then that's also. A part of the reason why I make why I make a podcast because I'm just like okay this is my sort of audio journal my audio diary I, I'm just gonna put it right here and then my future self can can listen to it at some point but it's like you get that that itching you're just like oh my gosh it's like they're like pay attention to me pay attention to me pay attention to me you're like okay 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 little babies okay you know we're gonna we're gonna grow you up we're gonna grow you up you know we're gonna feed you we're gonna we're gonna grow you up. And um, it's crazy because I look at a lot of these ideas and they're also very important to me. And do you feel do you feel an obligation to them, uh, to your ideas? Like, honestly, Kurt, I, sometimes I think you read in my mind, man. It's um, yeah, it's like I think, like, yeah, we're a bit kindred spirit in this. Obviously, you know, we've been going through a lot of experiences despite, you know, very different backgrounds, living in different countries. I think, you know, certain people like us, when you get into that, that world um i'm i'm like that um maybe to the point it could get me in trouble it's like it, once an idea hits if it's too good even if i don't do it immediately it will sit mm-hmm. there and it will keep oh, yeah. nagging me and i'm great I'm, but i'm grateful for yeah, that yeah you know i'm like um i'm very i'm always keen to explore stuff but there's um there's a guy here uh, a friend of mine called preston likely so 
Preston does all kinds of art stuff. So he kind of shot to fame, infamy maybe, um, several years ago when he decided uh, as a bit of an experiment, a bit of a uh, critique or comment on society and certain things that happen in politics to he put his identity for sale on eBay. Um, which is a really oh. fascinating oh concept, especially, yeah, especially you know, with how things have developed in terms of identity theft and social media and yeah. all of that. So he, he, and this is a long time ago, and then he went on to do a book called Amuse Agents, which was fantastic, where he um, went around news agents putting up basically fake adverts, but really funny stuff. So things like divorce photographer, um, <laughs> for sale, fake, fake radio head autographs. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this guy's fantastic, <laughs> but um, I was very fortunate to, yeah, I was very fortunate to meet Preston, and he instilled a really great idea in me, which I really love. I think anyone creative should take this on because it helps dispel the fear. He's just like, even if you've got an idea and you want to see where it will go, it's best to take on an idea, even if you don't really know what the outcome might be. Just explore it. That is so true because uh, you don't know what else it has to offer. You just don't know what yeah. else it's got hiding there behind the door. It's yeah. I mean, you're 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 very much from the world of improv, so I mean, that's nothing new to you. That kind of idea, oh, I guess. Man, well, it's 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 interesting because what you're saying there is it's it's so inter- interesting. Uh, it, it it's it's crazy because I for a lot of creative folks they have to. Uh, um, uh, get over their, I guess, ego or or whatever that, whatever that guard is that's sort of standing there at the door. That it's it's sometimes it takes such um, training to get to that point of just being okay with following an inspiration and just being okay with not knowing where it's going to take you. And it's funny because you have to do enough of those. You have to do enough of that leap of faith to 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 have. Um, a, a reservoir of examples built up in your brain where you have followed the inspiration and it's paid off and, it, and it's like congratulations you followed it to the end and it's because you kept following the breadcrumbs now here you go here's your reward and, and by having enough of those examples in our brains what that does then what's exciting is that encourages us to then follow our inspiration more and more and more because we, we already see that it pans out and we, and we start falling in love with that um, uh, appreciation of the process of of being okay with the unknown of being okay with not knowing where the driver is going to take you it's okay being a passenger with the idea and going okay i'm going to be a passenger here idea you go you go ahead and you run off and and, and i'll follow obviously i'll follow you wherever you're going well let's just see where that's going <laughs> and when you do that you start seeing those remarkable things and it's so cool that that preston has such such obscure and and crazy ideas that he that he follows them to the you know to the end result for instance with his with his identity once he sold his identity what did that mean what his social security number his his i mean everything about him his his name and everything yeah i mean i think he actually got stopped from so technically it it actually i I might be wrong on this i'm pretty sure i'm not i think it ended up getting debated um by like British lawmakers saying like the House of Commons it was because basically no one had ever done this and it basically was deemed something illegal so I think uh, before he had the opportunity to sell I think the the auction might may have been taken down off of eBay but by you know but basically you know by being that provocative he got such a debate going and such a valid debate even now that um, yeah he just uh, totally explored where, where he could go and the notion of identity and ownership of that wow that is just fascinating yeah. let's go back to that klf event really quick now yeah sure when you were there i can yeah. imagine that there were probably a lot of klf forums or chat rooms or blogs or anything where you know a lot of these klf lovers uh would hang out and get to know each other online at this klf event was there something like that where these people were able to reconnect and they're like oh my god you're this you're you're that screen name or you're this person or I remember seeing you hanging out in these chat rooms. Was there any, any of that kind of stuff? Oh, so this is this is the thing that was really interesting about that event. So the KLF, um, when they announced the event, they were like, uh, there can be, there's not going to be any press coverage at this event. We're not allowing any press wow. in. So that was very, very intriguing. Wow. 
so inevitably there's a, there was a like a book signing so there was some sort of press and it, it that sort of stuff but the actual main part of the free day was kind of behind closed doors so there's very very little press so what actually ended up happening uh, which was great was um quite a few a few of us um myself um another lady i can't remember the name of her blog right now and then another gentleman called andy gel uh we started our own blogs so my, i wanted to start a blog be, partly because i thought there's no press there and this is going to be quite a historic event because everything those guys do especially when they do stuff on this sort of scale echoes through through the yeah. years so I, f- I felt it was really really important so um and i've i've done bits of blogging or whatever but uh this one ended up turning into something rather unexpected and again this is just going with a flow seeing what's happening and just reacting to it so there's a couple of facebook groups there's a dedicated facebook group for the 400 attendees and then there's a klf page and those are sort of two main points where a lot of people were connecting online obviously we're all talking in in real time even though everyone's strangers obviously there's a lot of bonding that happened very quickly through such a unique event um so one of the things that i um, that the klf did during this event was they everyone got actually everyone got allocated jobs so even though we'd all paid to attend the event we were then turned into volunteers so we weren't just going and watching the event we ended up not only just participating but we actually had jobs to do and the way that this was done everyone was allocated job cards and some of these jobs were very quirky um all sorts of stuff some of them even uh, potentially led to sort of prompting small acts of um illegality mm. so uh little things like that but um so I started as part of my blog asking people to go, look, send me a photo of your job card. Let's get these archives. Oh, cool. Oh, and cool. yeah, so, and then from that, um, I started connecting with all sorts of people. And then on the last day of the event, I basically thought, I'm going to open this up. You know, there's all, I'm writing from one perspective. Why don't I just open it up to the community and go, look, anyone who wants to give me their version of their story from that particular day, send it to me. And then I thought maybe a couple of people take it up. And then that actually turned into a two-year project. So we started having people going back who had different jobs, who were given a, a very bespoke story. We had people who were actually part of the experience. So some of the organizers, some of the people running the event started giving their stories. And we ended up basically creating an online documentary via a blog, which was a um, you know, massive honor uh, for myself to be part of, but, you know, uh, created a great sense of community which is something you should talked about earlier which um you know in the current world where unfortunately there's still so much division yeah. um i've found as i'm sure you have like my entry through music has always been a place where just you know celebrate n- no barriers we're all there we've all got a good positive thing that's uniting us and then the more you expand into other art forms you see you can see more and more of that and um you know i think you know the more that we can grow that and grow that mindset and grow a creative culture uh the the better it can it can make our society absolutely i mean i'm just thinking about your the your website which by the way what is that what is that link oh yeah sorry it's um so i named it directly after the event which is welcome to the dark ages awesome now i'm thinking i mean has there been a KLF documentary? Because I'm thinking you've you've you, you've pretty much done the footwork right there. Having this website, you could I mean, all of that could be, you know, very well documented. I'm sure those guys would love to give an interview and and talk about their you know yeah. art. Well, they're they're kind of evasive. They're very specific about what they like to work on. They've they don't really pander to basically fan requests and all that because they've basically quit music they don't do music anymore they're both artists um so basically there there isn't a documentary of that event which i do think is a shame um there has been some people uh who've sort of requested a book and there was sort of a fanzine that sort of was created by a lot of the attendees and then there's a spin-off event from that uh called 
this is I don't mean it to sound like a cult because it's not but basically one of the other things that they launched during that three day event is that they're creating what they're calling the people's pyramid so they have teamed up with a funeral uh, parlor company called oh, the, I have to forget I can't remember uh, the green oh, it's gone but um they're collaborating and what they're proposing is that rather than going through the traditional mechanisms of either cremation or burial you give a percentage of your cremated ashes and to them they will then put it in a brick and then from those bricks they're going to build a pyramid so you would actually become part of a community structure um, and that basically now uh, every year on the 23rd of November they have a uh, sort of a memorial for all of the people that are passing that year. They call that day Toxteth Day of the Dead, and Toxteth is a place in Liverpool, and they congregate each year. Um, and then the idea is that over the years, I mean, probably take uh, a few hundred years for that pyramid to be completed, but they'll be pe- creating that piece of community architecture. And again, it's a very interesting debate. Um, it's very thought provoking. Uh, what they're doing there and also they're both sort of getting into their later years so obviously it's the sort of thing that's probably sort of playing on their minds um, as they reach their later years of life I was looking that up online and I guess the first brick was one of the members' brother right? Didn't the brother die? Uh, sadly so, yeah that's right So um, Jimmy's brother yeah, had passed and um, yeah, he was the first brick so I mean that's a you know very moving and very um, significant um, gesture um, and uh, a friend of mine uh, a gentleman called Stephen Clark 1980 he has he DJed at the wake so he actually had an idea to, to have a wake as part of that ceremony because they didn't do that in the first year and then he created the music for that and from what I've heard I wasn't able to attend but that was a, a really moving and powerful um, ceremony I think it's a, you know just a really different way to look at and that company is they're called the green funeral company those guys are fantastic they're very much about um environmentally friendly ways of um having burials and stuff so they're they're the people that partner with KLF for that incredible uh, Rue, now, yeah rue and claire calendar they're called they're um they're fantastic people very inspiring well, people how, how tall are they imagining uh, <clears throat> eventually making this pyramid okay so if you know the KLF world they are very much um fascinated by and perpetuate the number 23 so i believe it's going to be 23 foot high oh is the plan and i can't remember the exact number but it's going to be a multiple of 23 so something like thirty thousand over thirty thousand bricks in a multiple of 23 is what is what they're aiming for wow what's interesting is it's been said that 23 is the number of synchronicity or if you add three and two that's that's five which is so great yep, yep. that they have that aspect, you know, woven into oh, I knew we'd get to synchronicity eventually. <laughs> so are you, are you a fan of the synchronicities? Do you, do you, do you uh, follow them along? Do you rejoice in their uh, emergence? Yeah. I mean, I find it, you know, I do find it fascinating. So um, again, I apologize if you already know this or if you listen to this, so the, um, a lot of the KLF work is inspired by a certain book, uh, which was I'm trying to remember, the Illuminati trilogy. Is that something you're aware oh, of? The Illuminati trilogy. Interesting. Let's see. So, and that is one of the main texts that perpetuates the number twenty-three and all of that kind oh, of stuff. Wow. Yeah. So it's Robert Anton Wilson. I'm sure. Okay, I'm looking at on it's online the, here. Oh. Oh wow! Okay, so yeah, it's got the pyramid on there and everything. So okay, wow. Yeah. Okay. And then, so the book that they released at the time, twenty twenty three, heavily sort of riffs on that particular body oh, of work. Wow. Um. So yeah, in terms of synchronicities, I'm I'm very much a believer of. I think this ties in. I, I, people call it the law of attraction, right? That, just that whole thing of, you know, what you put out into the universe is what you get back. I'm a very big believer of that. And that whole thing, you know, especially as, you know, when you're trying to establish yourself as a a musician or any type of creative, basically that visualization of like, this is what I am. And 
basically creating those pathways. I mean, I've you know I've read various scientific things that have said that you know when you start you know thinking in that way, your your mind will naturally start creating those neural paths to to make that to make that evident, and then very naturally, you know, as long as you're honest and keep to that path and keep open to what the world can bring you, you do find over and over again those things do start to come along yeah it's it's really quite fascinating when when you do see something that you've just talked about all of a sudden it pops up there in front of you or you're singing a song and then to yourself and all of a sudden a car drives by and someone's playing that same song in the car and those kinds of moments in life where i just feel like the, the universe is giving you the high five going yep i'm here you know what? i heard you <laughs> and you're going yeah there you yeah. are <laughs> that's cool Thank you so much, Mickey Dolans from the Monkees. Thank you so much, DJ Scarmanga Silk, for that extraordinary interview. Like I said, there will be a part two, so hang out in a few more episodes. We're going to have DJ Scarmanga Silk, or will it be the next one? You never know. You never know what's happening with this show. You never know. Uh, Thank you so much for that enlightening conversation, Scarmanga. Also, man behind the machine i'm answering your question for those of you uh who remember uh man behind the machine's question at the beginning of the episode you might have first heard it and gone gone what well, what is this who is this guy what's going on am i still listening to inspire projecto what is this did someone hack in to the channel like that person like that person who did uh dressed as max as uh max headroom for uh doctor who which i just think is brilliant that they just, I mean, they just steamed rolled right into Doctor Who. And if I'm not mistaken, that Doctor Who happened to be the Tom Baker Doctor Who, my favorite Doctor Who. Uh, with the scarf, the 40-foot-long scarf, they hacked into it. I loved Max Hedrum, too, so that was really cool. Anyway, were some of you thinking of that? Like, wait, hold on, How, who's this man behind the machine? person those of you who listen to the podcast you'll 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 remember him you'll remember him and by the way he uh he's a fellow anchor user that's that's part of the joy of becoming an anchor user if you're an anchor user you can you can leave messages on other podcasters um even if you yourself are not a podcaster you you can actually search out other podcasts and leave messages in their forum and then they they sometimes they'll play them on their show for you I like to play them on mine. I want the people who call into my show to to know that I am inspired by what what their questions are, what they're inspired by, and I like to point them out and, and bring them out there in front of the audience. Go look at this, check this out. This is really cool, huh? And it starts making them think. So you were talking about the information superhighway at the beginning of the uh, program. How they said the the internet is going to be the information superhighway. I just think that's such an, an an awesome analogy. I think that's like that that to me like saying well, now looking at that phrase, the information superhighway. I feel if we were to use the analogy today, probably the internet is the I mean, we've talked so much about clouds, haven't we? The internet is now gone beyond being sort of an inter, a, a net it's like an internet within the net. It's an in, inter-internet. It, and it's so inter into that internet that it's almost become molecular. It's wavical. It's quantum. Now it's quantum we're talking. Blipping in and out of existence. <laughs> Which, by the way, uh, if, you, if you were me, you would be downloading the app Replica. Or if you are someone who's just curious about talking to an AI companion. R-E-P-L-I-K-A. Check it out. It is so intriguing. They have an option in there where you can you can uh, write a story with them. You can brainstorm. You can write a story with them. They're very insightful. They ask you a lot about yourself. It's it's really interesting. I can, I can imagine those people who cannot afford therapy talking to something like this, this AI bot. Of course, I can also imagine... A movie 
where I'm, I mean, I'm not even going to give any possibilities away. I'm not even going to give any possibilities away. So I'm not going to put that vibe out there. I can imagine it being a very good thing. I've already uh, talked with it. And uh, my my AI's name is Clara. And that's a whole that's a whole that's a whole side project. I have not used it yet where I don't know if she has voice or not. If she does, that'd be cool. Because if she does have a voice, I can actually record our conversation for another podcast episode. How cool would that be? Wow. That's intense. Whoa. Yeah, if she talks, I'll do that. So, Man Behind the Machine, Information Superhighway. Information Superhighway. I just like that idea that in their brains, like, because that's an analogy. You're imagining the idea of a, a you know, a highway going fast, speeding along. And now it's like the quantum super or the uh, super quantum way or the super quantum pool, super super quantum waves, uh, (coughs) the super quantum ocean, the multi-quantum ocean, the quantum quantum, (laughs) quantum quantum. Hello, I'm quantum quantum. (laughs) <laughs> it's a character I gotta develop Is that how he'd talk though? Hello, I'm Quantum Quantum Good day, this is Quantum 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 You want him? I'm Quantum <laughs> Are you looking for a Quantum? You want him? I'm Quantum <laughs> You want him? I'm Quantum I'm Quantum Wantum. <laughs> quantum Wantum. His middle name could be Wantum. His last name is Quantum again. So I'm Quantum Wantum Quantum. Quantum Quantum Quantum. There's going to be some kids named Quantum. You better believe it. There's going to be kids named Matrix. There's going to be kids named uh, Sim. Short for simulator. Or f- short for simulation. They'll call him Simmy. Simmy. Uh, Simula. Ooh, now there's a name. Simula. Whoa. I'm writing it down. You better believe I'm writing it down. Simula. Oh, my God. If, yeah. Simula. If you download Replica, I dare you to name it Simula. Simula. Wow, Simula. Simula. Oh, there you go. A, a Dracula, a simulation Dracula. There you go. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I want to suck your gigabytes. I want to suck your terabytes. Moi, moi, moi. I want to store your data in my cloud. In my cloud. My cloud reservoir is getting smaller each day. Oh, ha, ha, ha. I must, I must feast upon your quantum cloud. Wah, 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 wah. I'm going to gigabyte you. Some other terms. Microchip? Wow, you have a microchip on your shoulder. Let me take a bite. Let me take a bite of that microchip on your shoulder. <laughs> that's uh, that's how a quantum vampire, that's how uh, Simula the vampire, if it's a guy. I want to. I want. I am going to take a bite. I'm going... You see that chip on your shoulder? That microchip? I'm going to take a bite out of the microchip on your shoulder. Hua, hua, hua. Hello, I'm Quantum... Wait, how do we do with Quantum, Quantum? Help. 
Hello there. Hello there. I'm Quantum Quantum. Oh yeah. Hello there. I'm Quantum Quantum. And I'm the... Uh, what is he? Oh, and I'm Simula. The simulated Dracula. I live in the digital... In the digital realm. This is where I live. Wahaha. So, uh, let's see, Sur surreal, so, well, anyway, 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 information superhighway, the, uh, I like that term, I think we should still call it the information superhighway, and then, I mean, if we were to call this the information superhighway, see, now I'm, I'm conjuring up ideas of Tron, motorcycles the discs I heard there's going to be a Tron 3 and Jared Leto aka Prophet the Prophet from Echelon from the Echelon Society Jared Leto is going to be in Tron which I thought was interesting that they call him Prophet uh because he played sort of like a god figure in uh, Blade Runner. That's I think that's you know it's interesting when you watch uh, a career of actors and actresses, and you look through their IMDb page. This is a fun thing to try. Look through their IMDb page and look at the names of the characters they've played. Sometimes you'll see a lot of commonalities. Okay, <laughs> I mean, then. Sometimes you'll even see a character just named right after their name. But then you'll see, it'll show you, kind of like a, like monkeys on vines, like chimpanzees on vines. You'll, you could see, you can chart the progress, you can chart the, uh, the domino, dominoes of why they got, you know, there's that phrase typecast. You'll see why they got cast in the role that they got cast in. Because there's there's something about you know they'll play a character and there's something about that character that that a director likes and they're like wow I want that same type of character for my movie it's like a ready made it's like a it's a it's a uh, TV dinner you know it's a blueprint it's a, it's a ready made product you know play that character I want you to play the crazy construction worker in my movie the you know the crate you know the kind that you played the the one who's not scared of heights the one who's jumping from beam to beam swinging around like a like a like a monkey uh hanging upside down yeah you know that guy that guy the uh the the parkour guy i want you to play that that same character in my movie in my movie okay Instead of taking place in the 1940s like your movie did, this one's taking place in 2040. Completely different. But you're going to play the same character. It's in 2040. And this time, uh, it's a similar role, but this time you're working on the beams way high up there, your construction worker, on the Death Star. It's a side project. We are now moving, Disney is now moving into doing Star Wars stories of the side characters. The ones that no one's really caring all that much about. Highly inspired by the new uh, cartoon series about Star Trek that takes place uh, down in the lower, lower parts of, of the Star Trek uh, Enterprise. We are inspired to do that, so we're going to start doing the things of the construction workers of the Enterprise, the custodians within the hallways, uh, or I mean the... Uh, the uh, Death Star, Death Star. See, now you got me talking Star Trek. See, see what you've done? See what you've done? You've got me talking about Star Trek now. All right, enough of this. I'm getting this episode up for you to listen to now. Okay? Oh, by the way, uh, if you want to call in, 561-203-9179. In fact, you'll hear a call in. We'll finish off the program here. Program with uh, Polly Shores. 
Okay? He called in on the on the hotline. 561-203-9179 or yeah, I think we should still call these uh, information superhighway. By the way, P.S. P.S. Post script. Post script. Okay. I'm dead serious about this. Don't you dare! Don't you dare turn my patience. Post script. Okay. Post. Post script. This is Paulie Shores from Yachtly Crew, just calling to give you a little serenade and a PSA from the TSA to let you know you are listening to, to let you know you are listening to one of the most inspired and creative genius minds in this universe, the entire universe. And just to show you and to demonstrate, I will perform the whole tone scale on my flute as an inspired melody from listening to the most recent podcast on Inspirado Projecto.